final talk, um, uh, which I'm not an entirely disinterested party, is from Veronia Iskander and Will Jones. Uh, Veronia is a PhD student at the Technical University of Dresden, and she started this work under the Google Summer of Code, and Will Jones and I were her supervisors. Uh, the work was so good that when GSOC finished, we have carried on with it. And I think it's fair to say that this talk is very much within the spirit of a meetup. There's going to be a lot more questions than answers. And if you want to hear more on this subject, and indeed more of the um, previous talk, then do attend the Risk Five Summit, where both Codeplay and uh, Veronia and William are speaking in the Lightning Talks tracks. So, uh, Veronia, over to you. Uh, over to me, actually. I think I'm the one. Oh, over to William. Okay, I wasn't sure what all um, you were doing. Yeah, well. that's fine. Um, just, just a bit before we start, I'm, I'm losing my voice a little, so let me know if I'm um, losing it too much to be comprehensible. Yes. Yeah, so th this is a talk that is extending work that we did, um, well, extending some work we did last year in collaboration with the University of Southampton. And in fact, I think we presented this at the last London Risk Five meetup in January. That was the last one. Um, we being the the students um, in Southampton who did the work. So, as Jeremy said, this is we're kind of hoping to make this sort of a two way question session. So, we're going to spend about maybe ten minutes discussing and introducing the work um, for those who haven't seen it or didn't see the last one at the last uh, London Risk Five meetup. Um, and then we've got a bunch of questions. Uh, I know Veronia has a bunch of things she wants to ask the experts in the audience. And, you know, hopefully you guys have questions that you want to ask us as well. So, so uh, as background for this project, this, this project um, was a collaboration between Ember Cosm and the University of Southampton in the first instance. Uh, and as Jeremy said, that went so amazingly well that we decided to continue the project with the, the Google Summer of Code this year. The work done with Southampton was, uh, it was, well, we supervised one of six of their very bright master students uh, in, uh, as an industrial partner to one of their projects. We set them the goal of accelerating AI broadly, um, with a risk five core and as we will see later they did a very very good job of it and while this was a very very good piece of work by the students they were limited in time and limited in the scope of what they could do and one of the things that was left undone was that the the code existed only as a very later model we we didn't have anything in real hardware and i think that's what veronia has been doing and what she's going to be talking about when she is speaking in a second so uh, we, we've kind of talked about this in the previous presentations a little bit already, but just some broad motivation for why we're doing this. Um, and the motivation isn't a very complicated one. It's like AI has become ubiquitous in what feels like every single field at the moment, and so too has hardware to accelerate AI. Sorry. Um, of particular interest is edge inference. You know, we've realized that piping all of your data into a big computer center and then doing operations on it is somewhere between inefficient and impossible to do at scale. And so we want to do things at the edge. This particularly benefits because the we don't have resources at the edge, benefits you know specialized hardware to do this more efficiently. And in particular, a way of doing this very efficiently in general is to make use of vector operations. Vector operations let us do things in parallel. And as the last talk pointed out, a lot of you know, a lot of AI and machine learning operations and the things in that broad scope basically boil down to linear algebra to matrix algebra and that all does just boil down to vectors. Um, so vector extension is very, very useful. So in terms of the first project we did in collaboration with the University of Southampton, as I said, we set them the very broad scope initially of accelerating AI using a RISC-V core. Um, and very sensibly, they, the, the um, project decision to sort of narrow this down was made. And what we actually ended up doing was just accelerating neural network inference specifically. Um, and, and as Jeremy said, one of the, the very interesting parts of this was that the, the decision to use 
the existing risk of infection instructions instead of um, bufloquinolone was made, but the fact that a very small number of these instructions led to a very, very good result. So this came out of the observation that looking at the tiny ML pair benchmark, which the, the students tested their code on, we, we can see on the graph on the left that, you know, almost was that a little over half of the computers taken up by the top three operations and that's 95% of the compute in total, 95% of that whole pie chart is taken up by 16 operations in total. Uh, and so the takeaway here is, you know, you look at the the stuff that's actually being done by a neural network inference, and almost all of it's done by a very, very small number of instructions and a very, very small number of different things. Um, and this motivated the students to basically start from the top and work their way down. And the end result was they implemented a AI vector accelerator with just 15 instructions from the risk five vector instruction set uh, and they saw the the amazing speed increase we can see on the right in their spike simulator they saw a sevenfold increase well, over a sevenfold increase with the accelerated core versus the baseline core and with the uh, verilator model they saw over a fivefold increase in the speed with the accelerated core over the baseline core um as i've said while the students did do some really really genuinely excellent work we're very pleased with them um, the, you know, they only had 10 weeks to do this, there were limits to what they could achieve. And as I've said, one of the limits was that they, they only really, they, they were only able to produce a very late model, not a, uh, you know, not realize anything in hardware. Uh, and in particular, their very late model was a little bit limited. You know, what, what they had created was a single stage system with no pipelining. Uh, and, you know, when we actually do these things, we have pipelining in, we, we would expect things to slow down a bit. We'll probably still see a very nice speed increase, but it's, you no. Know, it's not going to be quite as good as fivefold, probably. Um, another thing as well is that the, the verification of the system, the students had a damn good go at it, but frankly, there was just too much to verify in the time they had, uh, and that was left uh, a little bit unfinished. Uh, and that sort of leads us to the bit I'm going to hand over to Veronia on before I lose my voice entirely, um, which is the, the project to realize this in real silicon, to implement it in an FPGA, uh, and then see how performance is in a, a more realistic scenario. So, over to you. Uh, we can't hear you, Veronia. You're muted. Uh, Veronia, you're showing us unmuted, but we can't hear you. I'm not sure if something's gone wrong with your audio. You may find you want to leave and rejoin. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, so yeah, sorry for the technical problem. Um, so now I'm going to give um, a brief overview of what has been done so far in the project and then I'm opening the floor for discussion. So as William has mentioned, the goal of the JSOC project was to bring up the risk core and the accelerator on actual hardware. And um, the main step that we've started the project with was to bring the core by itself, the CV32E40P on the FPGA. So we started investigating how to bring up the core without the integration of the accelerator. And for that, we used the Open Hardware Group Core V MCU project. 
And the purpose of the Core V MCU is to showcase the, the RISC V CV32 E4TP fully verified RISC V, RISC -V core available from the, the Open Hardware Group. And it, of course, it's open source available on GitHub. So the core is connected to a set of peripherals and you can port it to several FPGA board. And one of them is the Nexus A7 board, which we are using for this project. So for the first stage of the project, we generated the BIS stream of the core by itself and downloaded it to the Nexus A7 board. And yeah, now we have the core working and some more details about the technical stuff. So Vivado is used for census implementation and bitstream generation. And after the bitstream is running on the FPGA, we of course need to run some binary or some ELF files on the RISC-V cores. And for this, we're using um, debugging methods. Mainly we're depending on open OCD and GDB for the connection to the HS2 debugger on the board. And therefore we can debug and run ELF binaries on the board. Of course, since we are compiling bare metal code, this stage also involves getting a linker script to assign the program sections to the correct addresses of the, of the core V MCU RAM. Now the debugging flow, this is a note um, inspired from our work. The debugging flow was rather not straightforward at the beginning. So this required a lot of work to get it done. And yeah, as a side note, this is all documented and all the steps required and the linker scripts, the open OCD configuration files are all documented in our um, JSOC project documentation. Now, of course, the next step was to integrate the AI accelerator code into the core VMCU project. And this is mainly some code changes done by the previous project. So they're trying to support, of course, the factory extensions and interfacing the core itself with the accelerator. And this has been done. So we have the bitstream of the integrated project running on the FPGA. And yeah, so to the current status of the project, at this point, we can run pure C programs. So we can run these programs without issue. But if we need to run assembly vector ex extension instructions, not everything is working as expected. So yeah, obviously this needs more robust testing of the accelerator and we need to write test benches to identify what exactly is failing when we're running on the hardware as opposed to the correct operation on very later. Yeah, so as we have said, this is like this is a um, status update of the current status of the um, of the project. And now I'm going to like open up some points for discussion. And this is inspired, of course, by the work that has been done. Yeah, so um, basically I'm going to explain every discussion point and then uh, if anyone has any questions or has any comments about the discussion points I'm mentioning, then please feel free to to ask. So the first thing is that, um, yeah. So the first thing is that the project has been verified on very later, and the very later test benches have failed to detect any errors. But then, of course, as I've mentioned, the the operation on the actual hardware is not working as expected. So this is the. Um, this is the trade-off here, whether to use the simple very later verification or you have to write the test benches for more complex test benches, of course, for the core VMCU. And then comes the other question, what exactly do you need to, um, to verify? So do you need to run the behavior simulation or do you need functional timing, um, timing tests or yeah, do you need to run post census testing or post implementation testing? So at which stage do you need to do this? Next point is the issue of pipelining. So our accelerator has several well-defined uh, stages for pipelining. So this can be done, but we have not done this yet because when we did the timing analysis, we had no issues. To the, because there were no timing violations, we decided to keep everything as a single stage. 
but then comes the question, do we need to consider this at some point in the future? Next point. Yeah, this is um, outside the, the scope of our project, but the, just like um, some brainstorming, whether to use um, an open um, an operating system would be beneficial in some cases. Of course, as I mentioned, we're using bare metal and there's no really, there's not really much room now to change this, but yeah, um, when is it good to consider something like free artists? Next is um, a point we're actually working on now because the simulation environment that the Open Hardware Group has is based on Quest SM from Siemens, of course. Um, and this is not open source and not, um, not free. So we were trying to use a different simulator from Xilinx, which is the Vivado uh, simulator. And then comes the, the problem of porting between the two simulators because they're two different companies, two different um, environments and everything is different. So um, yeah, wondering if anyone has experience in that point. Yeah, and a final point also for brainstorming, if anyone has um, any idea of related work that, that people have used using different cores than the one we have used for machine learning acceleration of course there's already the the talk before us as related work yeah um so yeah as i mentioned these are just some points if someone has any input to add and also if anybody has questions please feel feel free to ask thank you Thank you, Veronia and uh, William. Um, there is a comment or question from Leonidas Cosmidis, and apologies if I mispronounced that, from the Barcelona Supercomputer Center, um, asking whether you've got a bit more understanding of what it is that Verilator is missing when it's verifying. Yes, so the question is um, whether the, the, the problem was because there is non-sensizable code. So the answer to this point is no, we don't have latches. Everything is register based. Um, but uh, obviously there is another, like, there's another thing that very later cannot detect. Or maybe after the, the gate level implementation, some functionalities are are changed or some because of the optimizations done by Vivado, maybe some some gate level functionality has changed. Uh, the, the questions are coming thick and uh, fast. Um, um, one is uh, from Oana, Kunal and you um, and they're asking about the automated verification pipeline in place. Um, so, um, do you have any comments on that question? Yes, we do have some automated test cases. So the idea is that we generate some random inputs for our test cases, so different numbers to test the, um, the extensions. And as I remember, when we tested this on very later, the coverage was like 49%, which is a very bad number, but then there's an explanation for this, that we were only testing the vector extension part. So we're not testing every RISC-V instruction. And that is like, that is the percentage that very later has um, calculated because we're testing just some specific instructions. But if you look into the line coverage, like um, the, uh, very later generates some comments about which lines have been tested. So we've looked into that and this showed that the vector instructions are tested. Does this answer the question? So, um, it's, it's Simon here from Imperius and we, we did a lot of work on the core five verification environment in open hardware, which um, so a couple of things, I think the the verification environment that came with the core that you used won't work on Verilator because it uses system Verilog uh, behavioral constructs which don't run on it, which is a pity. That means Verilator works great on the RTL, but you can't run the test benches. Which So the question I have is, how have you verified your 
new instructions at all. Presumably you've written code, which is self-checking that ran on the Verilator, right? Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah. a very later test bench. And there is self-checking for every test case. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I hate to say verification isn't a matter of just running a few things like that. And that's why the open hardware guy spent two years getting that core well verified to a commercial level. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's the challenge when running. I mean, I think what you have to do is you have to think you through your verification strategy with Verilator. And lots of people use it for verification. It's not a problem. Um, it's just, you have to be, it's not just a matter of running your code through it. You have to be much more um, careful about what you're looking for and how you do it. And actually the coverage of the code that you've written actually doesn't help you that much. It's good, but you, what you need is what the whole verification world calls functional uh, coverage, where you're looking at how the instruction is actually working with data and often one instruction following the next to see how things are going wrong in the pipeline of your microarchitecture. So it's a um, you know, verification is one of the most complex things of hardware design. And yeah, I mean, it's fantastic if you've got stuff to run and you actually can see improvements in using vectors or whatever. But Verification is um, an art form, I'm afraid. Yeah. So, Simon, I think just to put in context, the original Verilator work was the effect of supervising a project at the height of um, uh, COVID-19 lockdown. So we couldn't get boards um, to people, which is why the original project used Verilator. And I think very much the purpose of, Ver of, uh, of Romeo and Will's work is to move much more to using a traditional core five MCU, hence the question of well, the okay. I'd, say, I'd, 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 I'd say, Jeremy, I'd say a simulator Verilator would be far easier to develop testing and get better functional verification than using hardware because you, you just don't have the visibility with the hardware. Whereas with Verilator, you can really see everything that's going on, which you can't in hardware. So I wouldn't, I don't think that's the issue at all. Just having a piece of hardware run the same thing Vera looks fantastic. Vera Lake is fantastic for what it does. It's perfect. Yeah. But, but, I, but I think, hence the question four, which is about the simulation tools of Xilinx versus Siemens, as we move to use the um, Core 5 verification flow and extend it. And I think Olaf made a point, are we using uh, FuseSock? And the answer is yes. Um, but I think the issues is not with running the tools. It's the fact that there are two specific features of the test benches, uh, the behavioral test benches, that don't work the same between the two. Is that correct, Verona? Um, yeah, we're not sure where the problem comes from. Verona, it is. The fact is the Xilinx will not run all of the stuff that's required in the test bench, that's all. Whereas mental quest of sim seems absolutely does. Uh, but I think that the challenge is there's um, so many features put in this these test bench languages that um, um, a lot of the simulators don't handle. It just tends to be the, the expensive ones that handle them because it's very comprehensive, complex. So I think you'll find that that test bench with the core five verification from open hardware won't run on a Xilinx simulator, to my knowledge. Okay, that's that's good to know. So, mm -hmm. Simon, you you actually recommend Quest as Sim, not no, Verilator. No, um, no, no, no. I, it's a different beast completely. Verilator, yes. Verilator is fantastic what it, for what it does, which is a very good open source Verilog RTL simulator. Whereas Quest as Sim has the whole of the system Verilog test bench capabilities, including all the uh, functional coverage capabilities. And that's why it costs money, basically, because it's got hundreds of man years of effort. And uh, Verilator will get there. It's just several years to go before it has all those features. And it's a great product and is being evolved. So a great, product, great open source project. And it is evolving and it's evolving very well, but it's still a very long way before it can meet the quality of commercial level verification. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's great. And I think, you know, I mean, we use Verilator a lot with our customers. You know, I mean, that's a great technology. It's really good um, feedback. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, the, there's another comment um, from Leonidas uh, BSC. Um, I think that's pointing you as another project um, uh, here. And um, we don't generally keep the public chat after um, these talks so people can be open and it's not doesn't live forever any indiscretion they've made. So um, I suggest... Um, uh, uh, Veronia, perhaps you want to capture that link before we end the uh, session. Okay. Um, okay. Um, any comments or questions from around the room? Okay. okay. So, um, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you to uh, Olaf um, for um, joining us and giving um, giving us an update on Serve. Um, thank you to Charles for a comprehensive update on the work of, of Codeplay. Um, and uh, thank you to Will and Veronia for giving us an update on that work. And just looking ahead, we're hoping that in January, um, Alana, Kunal, you, and Adom uh, oh, Adomus, yes, from Southampton University, who are picking up this work using the Core 5X interface, um, will give us another chapter into that. But before then, you can hear Will and uh, Veronia speaking a little more on their work at the RISC-5 Summit, as you can with Codeplay. I don't think it's you, Charles. All right, it might well be Charles. Someone from Codeplay, which might be Charles, will be speaking at the RISC-V Summit. Thank you all very much. Our next meeting will be in January. Um, um, and I look forward to seeing more and more of you here in person. So this becomes more and more of a networking event. Um, so thank you very much and good night. We'll leave the chat open for a little while for a bit more, on more on, online discussion. Those of us physically present will depart to the globe very shortly. Thank you very much. <laughs>